Hey, everybody. Welcome to this presentation. It looks like we've got a good crowd here, and it's a little bit past three. So why don't we go ahead and get started? Um, Fee, do you want to take it away? Yeah, thank you. Um, so hi, everyone. My name is Fee Nguyen. I'm a solution architect uh, slash GTM tech lead uh, for Anyscale. And I'm very pleased today to be joined by Shreyas Krishna Swami, and he's a software engineer on the Vayserve team. Um, so just, you know, a few housekeeping uh, items before I start, um, you know, the agenda for today. If you have any questions, you know, feel free to use the uh, Zoom, um, you know, chat window or Q&A. Um, and Shreyas, Simon, and, and myself will do our best to uh, answer your questions. Um, we'll also share, um, you know, the example and the code repo um, uh, after, uh, you know, the presentation today. So. Without further ado, let's get into it, right? So, you know, today, what I'd like to do is not to spend too much time on slide where I think, you know, we're all interested in technology and, you know, the, the product and, and how to build a um, inference pipeline. So we'll have uh, plenty of time to go through the example and the code and Shreyas is gonna do that. So I'm gonna give you a brief overview of Ray and Ray Serve. Um, you know, sort of a highlight, um, some of the example we have for you today using Vayserve in Feast, an online feature store, how to do that together and how, you know, Vayserve is a, you know, adequate model machine learning serving uh, option, um, you know, um, um, you know, for this tutorial. So first of all, uh, I'd like to start with what is Ray, right? So Ray is a framework that offers an API to build distributed application. Right, um, and it provides fine green uh, access control to um, allocate resources for your uh, task and actors. Right, um, and you'll see that many um, third-party libraries have built on top of Ray to, um, you know, uh, enable the backend to scale uh, very quickly and seamlessly using Ray. And we also have built some native library to cater the end-to-end -end machine learning uh, workflow. Right, so. We have Ray workflow for simple workflow on top of Ray. We have Ray data set for last mile uh, data preprocessing for machine learning. Um, and then we have Ray train for distributed uh, training, uh, Ray serve, which you know, we'll dive deeper today, uh, Ray tune for hyperparameter tuning and IL-lib um, for reinforcement learning, right? So Ray is that API that gives you that abstraction for distributed computing. And then, you know, we've built some further uh, higher level abstraction to build you know, machine learning, um, you know, models and concept. And so, you know, Ray is portable and open source. You can run Ray on a public cloud, such as AWS and uh, GCP, but as well on top of Kubernetes and on-premises, right? So very flexible and uh, portable. <clears throat> so you might be asking yourself, what is Rayserve, right? So what is in Rayserve, right? So we'll get into the more details, but Rayserve is a uh, machine learning model serving library that's got a uh, web framework backend that you know is pluggable. Uh, it is um, framework agnostic, so you can really use any um, Python, you know, environment, TensorFlow serving, TorchServe, XGBoost, Flask, right? As long as it is Python and compatible um, with uh, Python, right? And, you know, we'll, and we'll give you instant scaling and, you know, all the properties of Ray on top of uh, RayServe. So typically when we talk about um, machine learning uh, serving framework, it falls under, you know, a few different categories, right? So either people, uh, enable the machine learning model behind an endpoint um, using a web framework such as FastAPI or Flask, or you know sometimes serverless uh, you know services such as Lambda, um, or sometimes people use container technology and then incorporate the Python libraries into that container and then containerize and you know create a service around that. You know so Kubernetes and Docker are the uh, popular options as well. And you know, finally, we have a specialized system, right? And specialized machine learning model serving framework, such as 
KF serving southern core, um, cortex, um, you know, algorithmia, uh, SageMaker, Vertex.ai, right? And so how do you, you know, reconcile the microservices framework to, uh, you know, the machine learning model serving framework is something that, you know, we'll look into and how we sort of fit into that picture, right? So today there's no like one single solution and there's a lot of different options and uh, it can become, you know, quite challenging to pick the right one for you. So, you know, before we get into Rayserve, um, you know, I'll go through the architecture, right? So first you need a Ray cluster, right? So using the Ray core API or the Ray API to build a cluster is easy as you can see four line of codes um, and that, you know, will give you uh, the ability to run, um, you know, Rayserve on top of it. So Rayserve, uh, as I mentioned before, has a, prob a pluggable uh, web framework. And so when you start, a, um, a Rayserve uh, deployment, it will deploy for you a controller and a HTTP proxy on the Ray cluster, right? So these are two tasks that are being deployed on the cluster um, for you. And then when you invoke the model.deploy, it's gonna instantiate and deploy a model onto a task, you know, running on your cluster. And so this is an end-to-end -end if you will, you know, real-time inference um, machine learning model serving uh, DAG or pipeline, right? So you have an orchestrator that, you know, take maybe an input, and then maybe you want to route that orchestrator to a featureizer and a predictor, right? So all those um, components uh, can be allocated across different tasks, and each task can be, um, you know, um, configured with different resources property and different replica and auto scanning property, right? So this is how you orchestrate and offer a multi-step um, real-time machine learning model serving a pipeline or DAG. So, you know, let's dive a little bit more into, you know, some of those uh, configurations and uh, details about, you know, Rayserve. Right, so this is an example of a Rayserve deployment. So you can see that you can add attributes and information on that Rayserve deployment. So in this case, I want to, you know, have ten replicas, and then I can allocate the number of resources per, you know, serve deployment. And then, you know, there's other, you know, decorators and uh, functioning Rayserve. One of them is Ray Batch. If you want to, you know, do server-side batching and uh, batch all of your requests um, using uh, serve.batch as an example. So, you know, really uh, Rayserve give you a Python uh, first primitive to offer a real-time machine learning model pipeline, um, you know, on top of Ray. Right, so uh, Ray is scalable, it low latency and very efficient, and really, you know, giving you a Python language to really offer those very complex, you know, real-time inference pipeline that you know your business or your use case may uh, require. Um, another uh, very interesting uh, mm, uh, property of Rayserve is that you can allocate fractional, very fine-grained resource usage for your serve deployment. So in this case, you know, we are saying that I want to allocate 0 0.25 GPU and then 0 0.8 CPU for that serve and task, right, uh, deployment. And that, you know, will allow you to make a better use of your resources and maybe, you know, bean pack, you know, all those different deployment uh, onto the, um, you know, the same GPU host, for example, right? So let's say, you know, you have a sparse usage of your different models. So instead of using, you know, one, uh, model deployment on one GPU host, you can allocate more um, serve deployment on the same host. So very efficient and um, you know fine grained uh, control of those uh, deployment. And you know each of those uh, serve deployment can have I mentioned before the number of replica have different set of auto scanning features and capabilities, right? So in this case, you can really set uh, each serve deployment. Uh, with a different number of replicas and also auto scanning uh, configuration, right? So imagine that you have maybe different models. They can all be, uh, you know, have its own, if you will, you know, number of replica and auto scanning configuration, right? So uh, allowing a very fine grain, you know, a resource allocation, but also auto scanning policies. <clears throat> so Rayserve um, is based on Ray. And so, you know, you can scale different tasks and different actors in uh, in single digit milliseconds. 
um, and um, you know, giving you also the ability to uh, horizontally scale, um, you know, the number of replicas um, onto you know the same host or you know to a different host uh, using you know Ray uh, the Ray scheduler. And so you know when you think about uh, deploying a model in production. Um, very often people think, oh, I have a model, I'm gonna you know, put my model behind an endpoint and, um, and I'm done, right? But the reality is um, you may have some you know, um, data preprocessing right, for that single payload. Maybe you need to um, you know, fetch the data from an online feature store because your features are changing very quickly, right? Maybe you need to average across many uh, machine learning models and, and build an ensemble, right? Or maybe you have some business logic that you need to uh, you know, take into account, right? So very often when we are deploying machine learning model in production, it's not just one model beyond an endpoint, it's actually a number of activities and tasks. And so Ray sort of give you, um, you know, that Python program um, and primitive to allow you to author at a fine grain level, um, you know, all the different step and task that uh, is often required for a real time uh, machine learning model um, inference in, in production. So, you know, Ray serve is Python native, right? So as long as any uh, of those libraries that you want to incorporate in your uh, inference, real-time inference logic is Python, right? So you can incorporate that and make use of that, right? So we'll show you today how to integrate with Feast, but obviously, you know, Py PyTorch and TensorFlow and, you know, Jax, you know, as long as you can use Python, you can incorporate and use RayServe to serve uh, those, um, you know, capabilities, right? So it's really framework agnostic. The other interesting feature is um, the runtime environment. So you can see here that you can specify a runtime environment per serve deployment, right? So obviously you can use a Docker image to, um, you know, package your different uh, libraries and dependencies, but, you know, having a lightweight uh, way to define those different runtime environment um, for each of those serve deployment uh, is quite powerful and give you, you know, a lot more agility and um, speed in terms of iteration and uh, testing your capabilities and models. Um, so RayServe is also um, can uh, plug with a, a web uh, framework backend. And so, you know, in this case, you can use uh, Fast API um, and uh, make use of all the you know features that FastAPI provide, um, in addition to you know what Razor uh, bring you, right? And so um, you know if you think about microservices and web framework and uh, dev and testing and uh, type checking and you know all the benefits that FastAPI provide, you get that you know for free by using Razor and um, this FastAPI uh, pluggable uh, app or, or backend, if you will. So you know. Rayserve is really focused on uh, the inference uh, logic and pipeline and compute, right? And obviously um, there's a lot more to it uh, when uh, you need to deploy a machine learning model in production. And so, you know, we are gonna be focusing on creating all the integration um, with, you know, other best in breed uh, ML ops uh, tooling that are out there, right? So Arise and Y Labs for ML monitoring, um, Feast obviously for online feature store and as well ML flow and weight and biases for model registry. So today um, we'll have a very simple example, right? It's a multi-step inference pipeline um, that uh, will integrate with Feast, right? The online feature store. And so we are taking uh, the example of the loan application. We're gonna do a loan request um, in the preprocessor uh, serve handler or task, we're gonna fetch the features and then we're gonna pass that onto the inference that, you know, that will then return um, a model prediction, right? So here we'll show you how to decouple the preprocessor in the inference and show how you can create and author a multi-step uh, reserve um, deployment. Okay, I think that concludes the presentation. I, 
as promised, I wanted to be brief and you know leave plenty of time for the actual tutorial. But please, before um, you know, I hand it off uh, to uh, Shreyas. If you could, you know, take some time to fill out the survey, it would be you know very appreciated. I mean, we're always looking for feedback. This is an open source project, and so you know, feel free to join the Slack channel, the Surf channel, uh, get involved, uh, ping me or Shreyas or you know other people on the channel, and um, you know, please. Um, take a few minutes to uh, fill out the survey and, um, and then uh, we're gonna transition now to the tutorial. Yeah, thanks so much, Fee. Uh, yeah, and as Fee mentioned, folks, we really do appreciate uh, any feedback you could give us. So why don't we go ahead and give, give let's give two minutes for people to fill out the form. Uh, we can regroup at, uh, it looks like, well, uh, on my time zone, it'll be about 3.19. But uh, yeah, depending on your time zone, we'll, we'll regroup in two minutes and go over a code demo. But before then, please just take some time to fill out this demo, uh, fill out this feedback form. Thanks. Yep. In the meantime, if you have any questions or anything at all uh, that you, you'd like answered, go ahead and use the Q&A uh, inside of this webinar to uh, raise those questions and we can answer them as people are filling out the feedback form. Ah, looks like there's a question in the Q&A. Uh, the question is, do Kubeflow and Ray solve the same problem? Still a bit confused about all the tooling out there these days. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, it's not quite, I, the, yeah, Fee, I, I, can, I, I can try to take that. So Kubeflow and Ray are both open source, right? Um, now Kubeflow and Ray serve, so Ray serve is really spe specifically for machine learning model serving. I believe Kubeflow has something very similar, right? Called KF serving. Um, I think what we're seeing is that the feedback we're getting, and obviously you can run Ray serve on top of Kubernetes as well, right? So that's your preference as well. But I think Kubeflow and KF serving, they come with a lot of heavyweight packages such as Istio, and not a lot of people are, you know, willing to embark into that journey of, you know, Istio and Kubernetes and KF serving, right? Um, they feel a similar, um, I want to say, uh, need, right, for machine learning model serving framework open source on uh, Kubernetes. Um, but I think we did, you know, some flavors and different architectures between the two. Yeah, great response. Um, yeah, and I, I totally, yeah, it, just to like echo what V said, uh, like Kubeflow comes with a little bit more heavyweight dependencies and there's just a bit more setup involved uh, in order to get it up and running. Um, and hopefully as we'll see in the demo, the, the workflow to get from a model that you have running locally to a model that you're able to serve in production should be relatively smooth with RaceServe. Yeah, and it looks like we are at 3.20 now. So let's go ahead and jump into a code demo. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and share screen. see. Cool. Uh, and are you seeing me highlight like text right now on the screen? Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Sweet. Let's go ahead and get started. Uh, so this demo is going to be basically us taking a model that is uh, functioning locally and it's able to like augment features using a feature store and then get that model uh, up and running on Racer. 
So at the top of our notebook, what I've done here is set up a, uh, it's set up this project locally. And we'll go ahead and look at what it sets up in one second. So again, just to reiterate before we jump directly into the code, uh, the, the big benefit of Rayserve is that it kind of balances out uh, like both the ease of development that we want when we're working with simple web frameworks, as well as like the production readiness of much more specialized systems. So you kind of get the best of both worlds when you're working with Rayserve. Let's take a look at how it does that. So first, let's go over the code for the model. Uh, our model has a bit of metadata that we've specified here, uh, including uh, a checkpoint file that we have to store some model weights, uh, an encoder that we use inside of our model, and then um, some features that we use when we're doing model inference. So the model itself is a credit scoring model. And the credit scoring model, what it does is take uh, a set of features that's given as a request, and then it augments those features with extra features from a feature store. Uh, and in this case, we're using Feast as our feature store. Um, and then once it takes the features and augments them with even more features, it takes the uh, like that augmented feature and then feeds it to its model for inference. And then after that, the model takes all of this data, uh, runs a calculation, and decides whether or not the uh, request uh, is eligible for a loan or not. So let's dig in a little deeper into the code. Um, we have this class, credit scoring model. And inside of credit scoring model, when we initialize it, we load our model from that checkpoint file. Then we load the encoder from the encoder file. And then we set up our feature store. So we connect to our feature store. Once we're finished with that, what we can do is we can run this predict function. So what we can do is we can pass a model request to our credit scoring model. Uh, and we can pass it into this predict function. And that predict function will go ahead and pre-process the model request. And so when it pre-processes the model request, it runs this pre-process function. Uh, what this does is it does some transformations. So first what it does is it takes the model request and then it augments that model request data with data from the feature store. So once that's done, it does some joins and some other transformations to the actual features to get it in a format that we can feed to our model. After we're done pre-processing our uh, features, what we can do is we can take the resulting feature array and we can pass it to our model so that the model can do a prediction on that data. Then we take that prediction, we post-process it. In this case, in order to post-process it, we round the result. And then based on that result, we can decide whether or not uh, a loan was rejected or accepted. So in this case, what we can do is we can run this cell and once we run the cell, we'll define this credit scoring model that can work locally. So let's go ahead and check it out. So first we run the cell to get our metadata. Then we run the cell to define the credit scoring model. Awesome. And so we have this credit scoring model stored in this model uh, variable. So then what we can do is we can run a request locally. What I have here is a loan request that a user might pass into this model. So in this case, the loan request has data like zip code, date of birth, SSN, person age, person income, home ownership, employment length, uh, the reason that you're trying to take out a loan, and then the amount as well as the interest rate. So once we take that loan request, what we can do is we can pass it into that model predict function like I was talking about before. And then we can take the result. And then based on whether the result is a zero or a one, we know that the loan is either approved or rejected. So let's go ahead and run this loan request and see how our model behaves. All right, so we ran the loan request. Our model, uh, after some post-processing, uh, sees that this is the augmented inference request. So this is the request uh, with both the data that we provided as well as the data that the, the model got from the Feast feature store. So after it takes this inference request and actually runs inference on it, we're going to get a result from the model. In this case, we got 1.0. And because we interpret that uh, as a rejection, we print loan rejected. So this is kind of, uh, so the job of data scientists, machine learning engineers, uh, kind of brings us to this point in any sort of uh, model development workflow, where we have a model working locally, and we've tested it, uh, the weights are working, and as we can see, we're getting correct results from it. Um, what we want to do at this point is we want to serve the model. So when you serve a model, what, what does that exactly mean? Uh, well, when you serve a model, you take your model and then you 
basically need to expose it so that other applications or other users are able to make requests to that model and then get responses from it. Now, one way you can serve your model is using RayServe. And the way that you do that is you need to convert your model into what we call a RayServe deployment. Now, a RayServe deployment is, uh, so a, a RayServe deployment is like, it's an object that stores the uh, function or the class uh, that actually runs your inference. So in this case, that class would be this credit scoring model. Um, and then when you actually need to deploy your model, what you can do is you can deploy that deployment. And that'll take this model, upload it to what we call a rate cluster, a rate cluster, and then that model can be accessed using HTTP. So let's go ahead and take a look at that process. Yeah. So our goal when converting to a race serve deployment is to take our model uh, and then basically make it accessible by HTTP. So I'm going to go ahead and delete this code and we can start from scratch. Okay. So our goal is to take the model that we've already got, this credit scoring model, and we want to convert this into what we call a raise serve deployment. Now, the process to do this is pretty straightforward. What we can do is we can take our credit scoring model and we can subclass it. So we can create a new class. We'll call this the credit scoring deployment. And we'll have it inherit from the credit scoring model. The reason that this is useful is because now we know that the credit scoring deployment has all the same functionality as the credit scoring model. We didn't have to change any code in the credit scoring model at all. Uh, now what we need to do is add one function to our credit scoring deployment that can process requests that come in through HTTP. So in this case, what we can do is we can uh, define that function. Now by default, serve uses the dunder method call in order to as like the default function that's called whenever an HTTP request comes in. So we define this call method and it's going to take in self as well as the HTTP request that comes in. All right, so now what do we do with this request? Well, first we have to actually process the request and get the data from it. So in order to do that, we'll define this body variable that takes in the HTTP requests JSON body. So what this function does is, oh, whoops. And I'm going to be using this async await syntax because, uh, yeah, because we want to be able to take this JSON data. And in order to do that, we have to await for that JSON data. So we need to make sure that this call function is asynchronous. Um, anyways, so the HTTP request is going to come in and we're going to read any JSON data that's stored inside of it. And then we're going to set that equal to the body. Then what we can do, is we can call our own predict function. So because we're subclassing from credit scoring model, we have all the same functionality as a credit scoring model. So if we go back to credit scoring model, we see that we have this predict function. What we can do is we can pass our, uh, our JSON body from the HTTP request directly into that predict function uh, and treat it as the model request. So we can do a self.predict on the body that we get from the JSON. Uh, and this body will be our model request. And then we can go ahead and return that once we finish the prediction. Now, the last thing we need to do to convert our credit scoring model into a race serve deployment is to decorate it with this at serve.deployment decorator. What this does is take this uh, ordinary Python class and convert it into this race serve deployment object. And this deployment object, again, is really useful because what we can do, as we'll see in a moment, is uh, once we're done defining this, uh, like once we're, defined, once we're done defining this class, we can go ahead and do like a one line call to this function called deploy. And that'll push your uh, deployment to a Ray cluster where it can be accessed over HTTP. So let me go ahead and get rid of these comments. Let me get rid of this import, which we're not using. And this will define our deployment. So let's go ahead and run that. Then we have to go ahead and start Ray. So this cell right here starts a local Ray cluster on my laptop. 
And it's going to go ahead and start a serve application on top of that Ray cluster. So Ray, as V mentioned, is a pretty broad uh, distributed, like distributed computing framework. And so there's many different libraries that are built on top of Ray. One of them is serve. And so what we're doing is we're starting Ray and then we're starting serve on top of it. So let's go ahead and run that cell. Yep, we've started Ray and then we've started serve. Uh, and as we can see, we've started serve in uh, what we call an anonymous namespace. Then we can go ahead and deploy this credit scoring deployment to serve. Awesome. So as we can see, the deployment credit scoring deployment is ready at this credit scoring deployment endpoint. And again, this is kind of the magic of CERP, right? We had to make very minimal code changes. We added a decorator and one function to handle any HTTP requests that are coming in. And then in order to deploy our deployment, we made one Python function call and we're able to, uh, we're able to see that that deployment is deployed. So now let's go ahead and test this deployment. So in order to test this deployment, what we're going to do is we're going to run the same loan request. So the same loan request that we ran locally, we're going to try running over HTTP and seeing what we get back. So let's take a look at the code. First, we're going to import this requests library, which will allow us to make HTTP requests through Python. Then we define our loan request with the same data that we had previously. And then what we do is we make a post request to that credit scoring deployment endpoint. And we're going to pass in this loan request as our JSON data. So when we pass in our loan request as that JSON data, uh, this data will get passed into the uh, into that call method that we defined, and then it'll get unpacked and then passed into the predict function. Then we do the same post processing to get the result, and then we print out our result. So let's go ahead and run it. Awesome. So again, we got the inference result one, we got loan rejected, which is what we expect uh, because that's what we got when we ran this locally. The, the magical thing here, the thing that's different between when we ran this now and when we ran this earlier is we're making this request over HTTP. Right. So as you can imagine, eventually what you could do is you could uh, start a Ray cluster in a cloud instance or in a cloud instance or a computing cluster somewhere else. And then you could deploy this deployment on that cluster. So anybody in the public can go ahead and access that endpoint as well as your model. All right. So this uh, is kind of the core of model serving in general. Right. But there are a few things that makes Ray, that make Racer really special. And one of them is the fact that RayServe is an extremely scalable uh, model serving framework. So this lets you really easily scale the uh, scale up your scale up and scale down your model serving capabilities. Um, so one way we can scale up and scale down our model serving capabilities is by modifying this decorator. So right now, this add serve deployment decorator doesn't have uh, any parameters. But what we can do is we can add a parameter to it. Say the number of replicas. And we can set it equal to two. We can set it equal to three. Um, what this controls is the number of, you can think of it as the, the number of processes that are running this model inside of your cluster. So if I set this to one, which it is by default, that means that there's one process running inside of your computing cluster that's running that credit scoring model. All right. But if it turns out that you have many requests coming in, you want to be able to handle lots of them at once, what you can do is you can change this parameter to any number that you want uh, in order to make that number of processes that are serving this credit scoring model uh, in your computing cluster at once. So then you can direct requests to any one of these that are running. And that gives you enough that, that can, and by doing that, you can increase your uh, throughput uh, because you can serve more queries at a time. So right now I'm going to leave this at one, uh, but I want to talk a little bit more about some of the implications uh, that come with being able to scale your model so easily, right? And one of the implications is that when you scale your model, uh, generally the reason you want to scale your model is because there's some sort of bottleneck inside of your deployment, right? Maybe your model is a little bit too slow. Maybe you have too many queries coming in. Um, so you want multiple copies of this model in order to serve more requests. Well, if we take a look at the model that we have, right, our credit scoring model, there's really two reasons that it might be bottlenecked, right? One is the feature store itself might be uh, 
the, the, so there are two possible bottlenecks. One is that the feature store could be the bottleneck, and the other is that the actual model could be the bottleneck, right? The feature store is network bound, and it requires a lot of IOs. So if we have low memory, if our network is really slow, uh, there is potential for our, for our feature store to be the bottleneck of our deployment. On the other hand, our, uh, our model is compute bound, right? It requires a lot of CPU, a lot of GPU. So if we don't have that many CPU or GPUs available, that could potentially be the bottleneck. But if we were to scale up our replicas, so if we were to scale up this credit scoring deployment uh, just by tuning this number of replicas, then what we're essentially doing is we're claiming both extra memory and extra CPUs and GPUs, right? Because we're uh, taking this process and then we're copying it multiple times uh, in order to claim more IO and then more CPU and GPU. The problem is that that could potentially be wasteful, right? Because there's a chance that we're only compute bound or that we're only network bound, but perhaps we're not bound by both of them. So there's no reason to scale up everything. Instead, we can control which part of this machine learning pipeline we want to scale. So let's take a look at what that means. In theory, what we could do is instead of having our credit scoring deployment be the only deployment, we could split it up into two different deployments. We could have a preprocessor deployment and a credit scoring inference deployment. This is really useful because we can scale up our preprocessor separately from the inference, right? So if we want more power for preprocessing, we scale up our preprocessor deployment. If we want more power for our inference, we scale up our inference deployment. So let's take a look at how that looks like in code. Let's go ahead and grab our initial credit scoring model. Okay, and then let's try to divide this into two separate classes, uh, one that handles the pre-processing and then one that handles the inference. So let's create one class. Yeah, let's make this the pre-processor deployment and let's make this the credit scoring inference deployment. All right, so let's take a look at what this means. So right now in our credit scoring model, we have this predict function that does both the pre-processing and the actual prediction. Instead, what we want is for one of the classes to do just the pre-processing and for one of the other classes to do just the prediction. So I'm gonna go ahead and copy all of this code. over to my inference deployment. And what we'll do is for each of these classes, we'll go ahead and cut all of the information that we don't need uh, in order to split up the logic. So let me go ahead and fix the indent there. All right, so let's start with our preprocessor. So inside of our preprocessor deployment, we don't actually need to load any sort of model, right? Because all we want to do is preprocessing. We're going to keep the encoder because we use that in order to uh, augment the features. And we're going to keep the feature store because we also use that for, our, for the feature augmentation. We no longer need to load anything from a checkpoint inside of this preprocessor. So we can go ahead and remove that. Um, similarly, we don't need to do any sort of prediction. right? Uh, instead, what we can do is we can create the call method directly. And this will take in an HTTP request. And what it'll do is it'll call the predict function, or sorry, not the predict function, it'll call the preprocess function. And it'll take in the model request. And the model request is going to be the JSON body from our HTTP request. So 
then we need to do some extra. So we, we have some extra work to do inside of this call function because somehow we need to talk to our other deployment, uh, like our inference deployment and get it to actually do a prediction. Uh, but we'll go ahead and return to this in a minute. So back to this, uh, back to this class, we no longer need to do a prediction in this class. We can go ahead and remove this function. We still want to do pre-processing, so we'll keep this function as is. And then we'll go ahead and keep the original encoding and the get online features from feast uh, helper functions, because we're going to need those in order to augment our actual features that we pass into the model. Now, inside of our inference deployment, what we need to do is uh, purely inference. So we no longer need to do any sort of pre-processing. So what that means is we don't have to worry about a feast feature store inside of our inference deployment, because we'll be working with the feature store inside of our pre-processing deployment. We still need the load from checkpoint because we still need to be able to load a model from a checkpoint. We still need the predict function. But in this case, the predict function is going to take in the features array directly. And that's because the features array uh, should be calculated by our preprocessor, and it, so it shouldn't need to be recalculated here. So we can take in the features array directly, and then we can run a prediction. We no longer need to do any preprocessing inside of the inference deployment, so we can get rid of that. Uh, we don't need to get any online features from our Feast feature store inside of the prediction, so we can remove that. All right. And now going back to that to do we left, right? We still need to somehow, so we still need to somehow take the HTTP request that'll come to our preprocessor, and we need to route it to our uh, actual inference deployment so that the inference deployment can run inference. And then we need to return the response. So in order to do this, serve offers something called the serve handle. We can think of this as sort of a reference to another deployment that we can use to make calls to it. So what we can do is we can make a call. So let's get the handle first. Um, we'll call this the inference deployment handle. is equal to serve.getHandle. And then we pass in the name of our deployment. In, the case, in this case, the name of our deployment is credit scoring inference deployment. Uh, and so what this does is, or sorry, I messed up the syntax a little bit there. It's get deployment.getHandle. So what we're doing here is we're asking serve to get us the deployment credit scoring inference deployment and to get us a handle to that deployment. So we can use this handle to make requests to that deployment. So in this case, uh, one example is we want to be able to call the predict function on this credit scoring inference deployment. So we can get uh, a response is equal to this inference deployment handle dot predict dot remote, or sorry, dot predict dot remote, and then we can pass in the uh, argument to prediction in these parentheses here. So in this case, predict, let's see, predict expects this features array. The features array is going to be what we get from uh, our preprocess function. So let's go ahead and store that features array. And then we can pass that into our uh, inference deployments prediction function. And then what we can do is we can return ray.get response. So what we're doing here is we're taking, so what we're doing there is uh, Ray, so Ray itself and serve is a distributed systems framework. And one of the optimizations it does is that whenever we make uh, calls to uh, things like a serve, uh, a serve deployment, it doesn't immediately do the calculation. Instead, what it does is it queues up the calculation and then it returns uh, like a reference to that calculation. So if we want to return the results of it, what we do is we call ray.get on that reference, and then we'll get the result. So this will give us the result of our inference. And now what we can do is we can remove the credit scoring deployment that we had initially deployed. And instead, we can deploy our split up deployment, our inference deployment, and our preprocessor deployment. So let me go ahead and run this. Let's 
Let's see. Credit scoring inference deployment has no ah. That's right. I forgot to do one last thing, which is to add the decorators. Right? We want to turn these classes into serve deployments. So let's make sure to add in our decorator. We want that to be a serve deployment. We want this to be a serve deployment. So let's go ahead and add those in and then try rerunning. Awesome. So our credit scoring inference deployment is ready and our credit scoring preprocessor deployment is ready. So now what we can do is we can try to run a test. So again, we're testing with the same loan request. We're going to be sending that loan request to our preprocessor first so that it can do the preprocessing and then forward it to our model. And then we're going to get the result. And using the result, we can tell whether the loan is approved or rejected. So we, run the, uh, we, we ran the test. We can see that the credit scoring preprocessor deployment uh, got this inference request. And we can see that we got the result one, which we interpret as a rejected loan. So this, this is a really useful example to highlight uh, like two major strengths of Serve. Right? One is that you can split up your deployments uh, so that you can scale them based on uh, individual resource needs instead of having to group all the deployments together and then trying to figure out what exactly the bottleneck might be inside of your application. And the other is that when you're working with these kinds of pipelines or graphs uh, where you have one deployment talking to another deployment, you can treat these as Python classes, right? As you saw, I defined a credit scoring preprocessor deployment, and I was able to make calls to the credit scoring inference deployment using Python syntax, right? I was able to treat it like a Python object. I was able to call its function like a Python function. So it's a lot more straightforward to work with multiple, uh, with many different like deployments or models that need to talk to each other uh, in this sort of setup because you're using native Python syntax in order to do it. So one other concept I want to go over in this demo is that fast API integration that Phoebe was talking about. So RaceServe has some native integration with fast API, which is a web server that provides some really useful additional capabilities. Um, one of them, for example, is that fast API integrates with this library called Pydantic, which allows it to do uh, some really like intricate validation over the, in, over the requests that are coming in through HTTP and the responses that we're sending back. So for instance, if we wanted to validate that the format of our JSON actually always contained like a zip code, always contained a date of birth and an SSN, always contained a person age, so on and so forth. And if we want to validate that, for example, the person age is always an integer or the date of birth SSN is always a string, what we can use is fast API to do that validation for us automatically. So in this cell, what we have is we have the same credit scoring preprocessor deployment, and we have the same credit, uh, sorry, we, we have the same credit scoring preprocessor deployment. And what we've added is this loan request class and this loan decision class. So the loan request class has that same schema that we've been using for all of our JSON requests. As you can see, it's defined a zip code, a date of birth and an SSN, so on and so forth. And we've set these all equal to the types that we expect to receive. Right? We expect the zip code to be an integer. We expect the date of birth to be a string. Age should be an integer, so on and so forth. And then the loan decision is the schema for what we're going to send back. We're going to send back a decision, and that decision is going to be a float. Right? In our case, it's going to be a 0 or a 1. So what we can do is we can convert our credit scoring preprocessor deployment into one that's integrated with fast API. The way we do that is we define this app uh, variable, which is equal to a fast API instance. We have this uh, other decorator, serve.ingress. Uh, we can pass our app into serve.ingress. And then inside of our deployment, we change our call function to this new route function. And so this function will respond to any post request that comes in through HTTP. And it'll always return something that's formatted as a loan decision. Right? Similarly, it also always expects a loan request to come over HTTP. So as you can see, there's a couple of differences between this route function and the call function that we've been using. Instead of having to do any, uh, any processing ourselves to take an HTTP request and then convert it into this model request, because we've said that we expect the uh, HTTP request to contain a loan request, uh, Fast API will take care of that for us. And it'll unpack that JSON into a loan request. Then what we can do is we can pass that loan request as a dictionary into our preprocess function. We get our features array. And then 
just as we did before, we can get a handle to our inference deployment, and then we can run the prediction in the inference deployment, and then we can get the output, and then we can return our decision. So let's go ahead and run this. And what's going on now is serve is updating our preprocessor deployment with this new deployment that uses fast API. And then what we can do is we can test it again using our same uh, using like our same testing code. So again, we're going to run the same loan request. We're going to try to hit that same endpoint, and we're going to see if we get a rejected loan. So in this case, oh, I think I made a typo somewhere. Yeah. Oh, that's right. I believe this needs to change. Yeah, that's right. So we needed to change a little bit of the post-processing because we've decided that we want the outputs to look like this loan decision format instead of just kind of like whatever the uh, machine learning model returned. So instead of doing some extra post-processing after we get the result, Fast API does it for us when we set it up. Uh, so then what we can do is we can still interpret the results as we did before. We see that the decision was a one. And so we know that the loan is rejected. Yeah. Uh, the other nice thing about Fast API is that it provides like an interactive UI for, our, for us to test our model. So in this case, you can access this endpoint, credit scoring preprocessor deployment slash docs. Uh, it's a little bit tricky to get set up on Google Colab. You have some instructions here if you want to try it on your own. But what I have is a setup that's working locally. So let me go ahead and share that. OK, so I have this notebook running locally. And what I've done is I have a fast API deployment that's running here. This is the this is the same code as we had running on Google Colab. So what we can do is we can go to this URL, localhost 8000, credit scoring preprocessor deployment slash docs. We can click on it. And this brings us to a UI that's automatically generated by Fast API. And this is really useful because it lets us make manual requests to our uh, deployment using this nice UI. So what I can do is I can copy and paste some of the parameters from our, zip, from our uh, loan request that we've been using. So for instance, we know that this is the request that keeps getting rejected. So we can take that data and copy here. I need to click try it out. We can take a zip code, or sorry, zip code, and then date of birth and SSN. Person age. Income, and then the rest of the data as well. In the interest rate. And then we can pass that in and we can vary these values, right? So instead of uh, 133, we can say that they're, you know, 95. We can maybe change the employment length to be 40. And we can say that the interest rate, maybe we want only a 1% interest rate. Uh, so then we can execute. And we got a successful response. We got a code 200. Uh, and again, like the, the loan was still rejected. So like the decision is still a one. Um, this is a really useful UI though. And because we've done it over fast API, we can do that automatic validation, right? So for instance, if I said person age was a string, so I said person age to blue, and then I tried to execute, what I'll get is an unprocessable entity because blue is not a valid integer. So we got a code 422 there. And so that uh, automatic UI generation is very useful when you're testing. And it's also useful uh, when you're using Fast API because you get that automatic validation, plus all the other benefits that Fast API provides. With that, that brings us to the end of the code demo. Um, but I want to go ahead and check if there are any questions. 
So if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A and we can go ahead and try to answer them. All right, a uh, question in the chat. Does Ray serve support custom per deployment Docker images? Um, so at the moment, what it does is, so at the moment what we have are Docker images that provide like, like we have pre-built Docker images with all of the Ray dependencies you need to run Ray applications. And what you can do is you can take those Docker images and layer on your own custom deployments, and you can run those on Kubernetes. Um, additionally, I believe that we're, tr we're, we're looking into uh, allowing more Docker customization in the future. So if that's something of interest to you, please do join our Slack. And uh, uh, yeah, feel free to like talk a little bit more about your use case and how you know, extra customization in Docker might be able to help. Uh, Fee, did you have anything to add to that? No, yeah, I think that um, that uh, you know, depending on if you're on the Ray OSS or you know on any scale, um, you know, those two options should be um, available. Yes. Yeah. And then another question: What are the available options to deploy a Ray cluster on AWS? Is it always via Kubernetes? Um, so I think you do have a couple of options. Uh, I believe you can. So you can uh, deploy it on Kubernetes, but I also believe we have EC2 support. Um, Fee, do you Yes, we can. Yeah, yeah, we, we can. Uh, there's two options. So obviously, Kubernetes is one that is quite popular, but actually, the one that was the first one out there available is uh, the Ray deployment on EC2, which is super easy. You, you know, have one YAML file, define the topology of your Ray cluster, and then one command, and uh, you can deploy on top of EC2. So, yes. Awesome. Um, Shreyas, there was one question about the Ray dashboard. Um, mm -hmm. And Simon put a link out there. Um, so you know, wondering maybe if you could quickly go through that, or maybe you can just share the link and people can click on it. Oh, gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, so the link I have running works locally. So it's uh, like a local URL. So you won't be able to access it on like my machine. But what you can do is you can run these notebooks on your machine and then access it through there. So let me see if I can get you a link. Okay, and then there's a, a couple of other questions. I'm gonna read it out loud. Sure. Um, a question from, I'm, I'm curious about the added latency when the original deployment was split up into two. Mm -hmm. Basically, you know, we started with one serve deployment and now we have two serve deployment. And so what is the, um, you know, the cost of added latency onto that? Yeah, that's a good question. Give me one second. Let me just post the link to the notebook. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And so the added latency of having like two deployments versus one, is that the question? Yeah, and then the question is, does it require two HTTP invocation, right? And is there, you know, some clarification about that? My understanding, you know, feel free to correct me, but there's a one HTTP uh, invocation, and then within the Ray uh, uh, serve handlers, it's a different protocol and much faster, right? Yep, that's exactly right. So the uh, initial deployment can be accessed over HTTP. Um, and then in order for the deployments to talk to each other, they don't actually use HTTP. I believe they use gRPC, uh, which doesn't have the added overhead of HTTP. Uh, so it's the, yeah, the, the additional latency, uh, there, there may be a little bit more additional latency, but it's not going to be uh, as high as like an extra HTTP request. Thank you. Yep. Uh, let's see, another question. If I want to have different version of the same model being deployed, like version one and version two for mm -hmm. backwards com compatibility, um, does serve have a simple way of going about that? Yeah, that's a good question. So yeah, serves serve serve doesn't have like uh, let me think about that. So if you have multiple models and you want to be able to deploy them. Yeah, so there's a couple of options that you can do for that. One is you can create like a separate deployment in order to support uh, the different versions of your models. So for instance, uh, we had like that credit scoring preprocessor deployment. Maybe you want to have an updated preprocessor. What you can do is you can uh, like create a credit scoring preprocessor deployment v1 and then deploy 
whatever the version one of that preprocessor is, and then you can create a credit scoring preprocessor deployment v2, and then deploy that version. Um, also, RaceServe has uh, rolling upgrades. So if you want to, if you want to like, so RaceServe has rolling upgrades, and it also has like uh, this notion of a reconfigure method. So what you can do is you can take live deployments, and then you can update them to use updated, for example, model weights or an updated function, an updated class. Uh, with relatively like low update times. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see, we have a few more questions. Can you have your fast API server in a separate host than your Ray cluster for inference? Separate host than your Ray cluster for inference. Uh, so I'm not too sure about that. I, I don't know if you can, have them in a separate host than this than the Ray cluster for inference. Uh, Dee, do you know anything about that? Yeah, I, I think the benefits of using Ray Server and Fast API together is really you know they are bundled into the framework, right? And so uh, that's where you get all the benefits of using the, those two together. You know, now obviously you can have another separate Fast API backend somewhere else and communicate over HTTP like you know microservices. Um, so you know, hopefully I address your question. Yeah. And then okay. I see another question in the Q&A. What if different apps need different PyP uh, dependencies? So by different apps, I assume you mean like different deployments. Uh, what you can do is, Fee mentioned that idea of runtime environments. Um, what you can do is for each of your deployments, you can define like, you can, you can modify the runtime environment that each of your deployments run in. So if you need a different like pip configuration for one deployment versus another, you can change that at serve.deployment decorator to add this runtime environment parameter. And you can tell it that, okay, this deployment needs pandas version, you know, pandas version one, whereas this other deployment needs pandas version two. Um, and that's totally fine. And your deployments will work uh, if you do that. Thank you. Okay. I think that's all the question we have. And we are just over time, which, you know, which, you know, it was great. Thank, thanks, Shreyas. It was very informative and educational. I learned a lot. Um, yeah, so you, we'll have this recording available online. So, you know, for whoever wants to catch up and uh, watch this again. Um, but with that, uh, thank you everyone for attending this tutorial and uh, hope to see you online in Slack uh, very soon. Yeah, thanks everybody.